Hello, Leapers, and welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Albie, and uh, with me today is Chris. And we are very fortunate to have, he played Kevin Zett in the ninth episode of season two of Quantum Leap, off the cuff. He is David Clayton Rogers. How you doing, David? I'm very fortunate to be here. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about it with you guys. I, I have seen a ton of the original series and I've watched all of season one. I'm kind of waiting to binge season two. Um, but I, I don't know if <laughs> a guest star spends more time with, you know, with the leaper than a guy who's handcuffed to him. So like, yeah. <laughs> I, that's gotta be some kind of record. I think you were with him in every scene pretty much. Yeah. And then, and in breaks too, you know, between scenes too, where the, you know, props would be like, do you guys want to take the handcuffs off? And I was like, no, Ray's awesome. I'm good. Ray was like, hey, take it off. please take it off. <laughs> yeah, we can take it. It's okay. We can take a break. We don't need to wear it all the time. Uh, Joe, the director was talking about, uh, different pairs of handcuffs and different types and bruises. And what was that like just being handcuffed for what? Seven days, eight days. Yeah, it was eight days and, you know, and you jump right into it. It's, it's a, it's a funny thing being a guest star where you come in and brand new and you're so excited to be there, but you also know that someone else was there the day before and was like the new best friend. And, you know, it's, it's a weird, and then at the end of eight days, if you're fortunate to be there for every day of production, you're gone. Um, it's, it's a weird thing, but also I know that for this show in particular, Ray has sort of the same experience, a flip side version of it, the same experience with these new actors coming in all the time. But yeah, there's, there's nothing like being physically chained to somebody within, you know, seven minutes of meeting them to like really force a bond. It's funny because it's it's keeping up a grand quantum leap tradition from the classic series. I think there are two episodes where Sam spends the entire episode uh, cuffed to somebody, or for the majority oh, really? anyway. I don't think. Well, there's one called Unchained where he's on a chain gang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there's, there's an episode called uh, Hunting We Will Go, which this episode reminded me so much of a Hunting We Will Go, and he's he's a bounty hunter. And he's oh. got, uh, he's handcuffed to Jane Sibbett the entire episode or most of the episode. Oh, great. So, I don't remember. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a weird thing when you come into a show and sometimes it's like, you know, there's a romance scene right off, right from the get go. But this was the first time that I've come into a show and just, you know, been handcuffed to somebody the entire time. <laughs> and they had, yes, they did have different versions. There's a handcuff with some mole skin on the inside. There's a handcuff that, opens on its own but for the most part ray was like oh the real ones just work better right I was like, sure yeah, okay sure. <laughs> <laughs> let's do this um, with the real handcuffs on yeah great good idea i i have to say your your comic timing and, and delivery of your lines in this episode were outstanding did you get started as a comedian or just comic acting improv uh, how did you get started in the business i um I did. I, I, I had one of those high school experiences that seems to not really exist in real life where like I played sports and then I did theater as well. And in the spring, I'd go do a play and be like, oh, we need some like big guys to play the guards in this Shakespearean piece. Let me go get the linemen from the football team. Um, and so it was sort of like a, it was a good melting pot. And it and it was. Um, the sort of setup where of course you had to audition for things, but if you wanted to participate, you could participate. Um, and so I, I brought some people over to the theater because of that. And I think I'd started doing theater in the first place just cause, um, I'd always enjoyed a drama class. Oh, also I, I did track one year in the spring. I was like, I'm slow. Um, <laughs> so I need something else to do next year. So auditioned for a play and just loved it. And then as life went on, just, you know, more and more of that went to college, um, did a ton of theater in college and then moved to New York and was doing some really awful East village theater within like a month of landing there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so it, it just sort of, it, it progressed naturally. Just, I've, I've just, I've always loved it. TV roles and movie roles. How did, how does that go from uh, one to the other? Um, 
I think you get a lot of one and then it goes to the other. So I'm still waiting for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did. I, theater's the love um, because you get to really play out a scene and, and, and you and there's like a danger to it. And you um, even if you're doing a, a play, even if you're doing 60 productions of something, it's still a little different, hopefully a little different every single time you do it. Um, and so I was in New York doing this theater and sometimes it was good. And sometimes it led to the breaking up of a theater company. Um, it was, a you know, sometimes there are eight people on stage and four in the audience and maybe one guy <laughs> lived in this theater. Um, but eventually I moved to LA to try and make money so I could pay for theater basically. Um, and I, I landed and, and kept getting, um, I, I had some good dramatic roles, but but a lot of the auditions were always for like the young JFK Jr. type or something. Um, and there's something internally that's just a little too squirrely for that character. Um, and so like I would land in between parts where I would get the, a part similar to the part on Quantum Leap where, you know, it's like, he can't stop talking. He's smart. He's comedic, but he also has like a deep heartfelt something going on. And those were the ones that like kept popping up, you know, be it in a Hallmark movie that was trying to push the envelope and be a little more serious mm -hmm. um, or be it in, you know, something like this quantum leap episode. So it's, there's, there's not been like a straight, um, comedy or drama trajectory it's more like the through line has been this kind of character i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um yeah i was thinking of every other holiday when i was talking about the movies uh, that was a good one i, I like those kind of no way you watched that like on Hallmark your own. style that movies like i try to binge holiday movies around the holiday that's good. Well, and there's there. I I shouldn't have said that. There's you. There's a whole cadre of people who are like, yeah, I watched that movie. I watch it like four times every yeah. Christmas. But exactly. that was they one have... where it was like, yeah, it was a Hallmark movie, but it was a little off kilter, or it, mm -hmm. or it was trying to be a Hallmark movie, but it was. Um, but everyone involved was like, what if we made it like good? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and that's nothing against hallmark movies that i would love to be in that like food chain it's fantastic but from the dp to the director to the writer to everyone working on it, they're like what if it just had a little more edge you know what if it was and i think you know my getting cast is also that like there's something i say squirrely other people have had kinder words for it but um you know it's sort of it's where i get to play a little bit of the bad guy um but yeah every other holiday was a blast the number two at my son's school and i live in la um there are plenty of celebs going through all of the schools and the number two at my son's school after we've been there for about a month pulled me aside and she was like i never do this <laughs> but you're absolutely one of my favorite actors and i was like it's that one episode of Gilmore Girls, right? And she's like, no, I haven't actually watched that. But every other holiday. Um, and uh, yeah, she's like, it, it's literally my favorite movie. So that, that's great. It's, I've had a journeyman get... career, but you, you, I've landed in some moments that have been really, really gratifying. The, those Hallmark type movies, it's a whole genre and a whole feeling. So around that time of the year, it's just great to have them on. And, um, there, you know, there's even a cruise of people that go every year off, uh, not even on Christmas, just that love the Hallmark style Christmas movies, you know? It's really? Kind of yeah. It's kind of almost like sci-fi fans, almost, you know, that many people like it. Yeah. So it's yeah. good work. It's good work. Yeah. So I could see, I could see uh, somebody stopping you and saying that. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, but even then it's sort of, we're the fringe Hallmark movie a little bit. <laughs> I do love Gilmore Girls though. I gotta admit. That's, that that's, and that's been a fun one that I did an episode of Gilmore Girls, I don't know, 20 plus years ago. Um, yeah. And That'd I'll be, be in the most random place and somebody would be like, you look like this guy who took Rory on a date. Like, <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> and that was your job. That's a great job to have. Oh, it's great. And that was <laughs> one where like, yeah, she was 
awesome. I, I loved working with her. She was so cool and so cute and so smart. And so like, that's one of those where like, I'm in an episode and I'm really just at dinner with her getting to hang out and try and make her laugh, which was like, this, what a great job this is. Also, I applied to Yale and I did not get in. And so they had <laughs> rebuilt um, the Yale campus and they'd rebuilt some some rooms like mm -hmm. to spec. So I actually got to, you know, I got to go to Yale for a week, which was great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's a great show. If you haven't watched it, Chris, that's worth a binge. I I have not, so I'm going to put it on my list, but I'm going to put David's episode on first, even if oh, it yeah, spoils absolutely. previous seasons. I, I don't think it's well, yeah, yeah, worth I it. You can jump in there <laughs> anywhere. It's yeah. a it's a yeah. pretty rabid fan base. I mean, similar yeah. to I I want to I want to turn a little bit to the quantum world. I I mean, I've heard people say rabid fan base, but that feels like it applies to a show like Gilmore Girls or something. Quantum Leap, I feel like, is just uh, there's something about the show that like Rabbit doesn't feel right. More like dedicated fan base or like hmm. deep fan or like heartfelt fan base or something mm -hmm. like that. I loved it so much, like so, so much. Um, and so when it got rebooted, it was one of the one of the rare times where something gets gets another go or gets reimagined and I'm not like, do we not have any original ideas? <laughs> that was one. Yeah. I didn't know it was happening and I drove by and saw, you know, Ray jumping on a bus stop. <laughs> like, yeah. <"Damn>. Yeah. <laughs> back. It's incredible. So what was the feeling like when you got, when you got the, the part on quantum leap to actually be on the show? It was great. I, uh, it was one of the rare instances where it was an offer and that just, that just feels good regardless. Um, you know, if someone's like, I have a, a one day offer for you to take out my trash because we're out of town. I'm like, totally. I don't have to audition for it. Mm -hmm. um, but so it was that that's great. I had auditioned for it previously and I'd wor worked with Martin previously on Blindspot. Um, and so after the strike, um, I had auditioned for the pilot for the space pilot um shuttle pilot and then after the strike uh ended it was just like all right it's firing back up let's hope something happens and got like a weekend phone call of like hey you want to do quantum leap <laughs> yes yes i do <laughs> um and then they started telling me about the part it was like it doesn't matter yeah whatever <laughs> <laughs> Great. I live like eight minutes away from the studio. I was like, did I need, I can come do a fitting right now. My manager was like, it's sun, it's 11 a.m. on a Sunday. I was like, I <laughs> still, you know, I'm in, I'm in. Um, yeah. So I was, I was super delighted. I, a fun, a really fun thing as a fan of the show, um, I think was, well, there are a lot of things. Uh, seeing, um, seeing Ray in it that to who's going to replace Scott is like a, that's a, a mega feat. And you just have to have somebody who is so likable and so talented and can really like an actor inside an actor. Um, and so that was a really fun thing to see, like from watching the pilot to see like, Oh, I think they got the guy. I think they got the right guy because I would love for it just to pick up with, you know, where's Sam now? Um, but obviously they didn't do that. So in reimagining it, who's going to be your new leaper? And you've got to find somebody that has that same or a similar sense of likability. And I, and I think that Ray has that. Um, and then I also think I, I'm just, I'm just talking here. I, there was a question, you know, nine minutes ago, <laughs> but I, um, oh, we love for it. anyone who, for anyone who's listening, I had some technical difficulty signing on. Both kids came in at one point. I'm in the garage. Um, I'm using the hotspot for my phone. Uh, so really, I'm going to talk until these guys cut me off. Um, <laughs> we've done yeah, five-hour podcasts before, just so you know. Yeah. Albie is just like, we, we've done five-hour podcasts before. Albie is just like challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, so in that case, I'm going to talk until my wife comes in. It's like, are you still on this? 
Uh, but another thing that I really love about the 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 new the sequel version of it is um that you have the episodic a leap each episode or sort of um you know special episodes accepted um but then also you have that like i i say that martin thing just because i saw some of it on blind spot as well but like the larger puzzle serialization um is a lot of fun too um and that for me at least i i imagine there's some people who want it to be just the same um but i i thought that that was a that was sort of a cool new version of it that could still stay true to the original. This this episode is like a fun uh, road trip, like uh, Midnight Run, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. You know, uh, is that different than say filming? You know, like a procedural crime drama where you're mostly standing sets or something. Just being on location so much and all the action. Well, the the, I mean, I alluded earlier. It's it's been a journeyman career. It's like uh, I've been in it for a long time, but like enough to get health insurance every year. Some years, just barely. Um, <laughs> but but there's a beautiful thing. My wife was on a show for six years called Army Wives. And in that time, I was doing pilots and I was doing guest spots or like a recurring arc. And she loved that show and she loved being on it. But I got to have so much fun because like I'm the guy who shows up and is like a pain in the ass as a jury member in the courtroom. Whereas, you know, the number six on the call sheet has a parking space right out front and a Maserati in it. But in that episode, he just gets to say like seven sentences. And most of them are like, wait a minute. And he gets to say like <laughs> versions of that seven times. So like a guest spot is almost always fun. Um, a lot of the time I'm there just going, I, I couldn't have killed her. I loved her. And you know, <laughs> like that, I've said almost that line on maybe four or five different things. But every now and then you get one that's just a blast. And and this one, yeah, it's it's always fun being a guest star. This in particular was incredible. And the like from day one, being on the '70s set um, on the Universal lot, like right on the town green under the clock tower and they've turned it into the seventies was yeah. It, it, that's, that's kind of the, that takes me back to being a kid and like seeing a play in a theater and then like walking backstage and seeing the sets and being like, it's a castle, but on the back, it's just plywood. <laughs> like that, Jumping into that seventies, elaborate seventies set with all these incredible extras. Um, who like were perfect casting for like, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but man, you look just like the guy who would be spending the whole day under the car, changing the oil pan. Like <laughs> it's incredible. And they, and particularly after the strike to come back into um, such a fully realized world was, was so much fun. So much fun. Well, you know, coming off of that, uh, we know that you guys were forced to really hit the ground running. You said you got a weekend phone call uh, right after the strike ended. And I'm curious to know, since it was a little bit of a rush job for you guys to get back into production, when you got on set, were there any unexpected challenges or surprises that, that you hadn't anticipated? Shockingly, no. Uh, it, it's one of the best sets I've ever been on. Um, I would, you know, I would couch it and say if if it weren't, but it, but there really weren't. I mean, it was it was it was stunning. Um, everyone was so appreciative. I think to be back at work for starters, um, but it also seems like that's the way this set goes like it, everyone's loving it everyone loves the gig loves being with everybody um there were i was there the first day that um that ray saw mason like walking around and the two of them ran to each other like the way my five-year-old daughter runs to a friend you know when she sees him on monday morning at preschool mm -hmm. um, like they were so they were giddy excited to see each other and um 
like everyone the the costumes crew is just like laughing the whole time everyone the the sets were unbelievable the props people um the producers and writers phenomenal um i'm generally a positive person but but this was like 10 out of 10 20 out of 10 and so no there really weren't any any hiccups that i saw um yeah and, and i it wasn't like uh that didn't necessarily mean like bad things i mean maybe positive things as well that just surprised you right getting on because it's such a dynamic episode and it's funny i asked this because when you see the episode um it seems fairly straightforward but we were talking to joe the director joe menendez and he you know, as he was breaking down the scenes when we were doing the commentary, I realized just how much movement is there and how much so much going into every scene. So I I have, a, I think, more of an appreciation for all of the stuff that you guys have to keep in mind when you're doing what looks like a deceptively simple scene. Right. So especially since you had to be in a car, the car is flipping over, you know, you have all the location. It, so. I, even things like that, even if not necessarily negative, but just just the frenetic pace has got to be something. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's testament to it's it's hard to pull it off. It's it's really hard to to pull off. Um, it's hard to pull off anything. I I directed a short film fifteen years ago, and as soon as I'm finished editing it, I'll I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's sort of like. A, you know, everyone should try and wear everybody's hat a little bit. And then you see, oh my God, that job is, that job's actually really, really difficult. Um, not getting clothes to scratch against the microphone. Like it's incredibly difficult to get good sound on a set and bad sound ruins it, you know? So like everybody's job, everyone's gotta be a pro and and really they killed it. And, and yeah, uh, Joe, Man, Joe was amazing. Um, on day one, an hour into it, he's talking about a scene, and his he had like a little a chain around his neck with a little ring that was holding his sunglasses, and he had glasses and then sunglasses, and he would swap between. He's talking about it, and the gla it, the glasses flew out, hit the ground, and exploded in a way that I've never seen anything explode that didn't have a squib attached to it. <laughs> and it happened like right there as he's talking about the scene he's so animated fell and they like truly like exploded they're you're not fixing them um they fell in a way that like it doesn't make sense um <laughs> props came up and actually had another pair of glasses like those in the sunglasses kit and was like do you want these and he was like that, how do you have that it's <laughs> what we have we had we happen to have those um so like the joe getting into it the breaking of the glasses the quick replacement all right let's keep moving that was the vibe for the whole time um and it required that because yeah the uh the writer alex who was awesome um he said that basically martin was like yeah you want to do that you want to you want to do that but what if, what about if you flooded the basement and he was like I can also flood the basement where the fight's going to be. Um, that, like, add everything, add, add all the stuff. So even something like me being chained to a toilet and trying to pull it off, when there's a camera behind it, that toilet's not attached to anything. So I have to be pretending. I have to be like faking. If I actually pull it, the whole, the whole thing is going to fall apart. Um, so like you have to be, you have to be faking it. And that's just for the gag of the handcuffs on the toilet. So you, you take that to everything else, the car flipping over the explosion of the car with us running away and diving with the real explosion happening behind us. That's real. There's not, they might've sweetened it with a little bit of CGI. I don't even know if they did. I saw the playback and they didn't need to, but like, that's real. The teams that pulled all of this stuff off, it was incredible all the way down to the guy who was there um at lunch a few of the days um who was just like flipping out about his organic uh vegan stuff the, the guy <laughs> the guy making uh, avocado toast on the first day there and he was only there a few of the days but like 
his level of excitement on over the avocado toast. I was like, yeah, of course you're on this show. Everyone, <laughs> everyone here is so fired up and is just killing it. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Uh, I would encourage all of the listeners who are listening to this interview on the main podcast to go over to the YouTube channel and watch the director's commentary that we've done with Joe Menendez, because he was talking about that scene in particular with the car blowing up. Um, Correct me if, if my memory is wrong. I think he said you guys were able to get that in one take. Yeah. yeah. And and I was thinking, you better get it in one take. You're going to blow up a car <laughs> twice? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that that's also, uh, that's like basically out in the wild. So they're, they're hosing down all of the plants within the like fallout radius. Um yeah, the amount of work that went into that, it, it, crazy. And and we rehearsed the actual moment a ton of times before we really did it live. But um, yeah, I, I have not been on a ton of things where you do it once and it works. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so no, that was, I would strongly encourage people to go watch Joe's commentary. I want to watch it with Joe's commentary. <laughs> he was awesome. He was really awesome. And, and it's also easy for me to say everything went great because, you know, I, I show up and I do the thing. Um, but, uh, no, for someone, for Joe, like for Joe, for the first AD, for the producers, all of the things to be lined up and in place. Um, it's a, it's a, not even a Herculean, um, feat. It's just like, it's like juggling, you know, or, uh, juggling kittens it's like herding kittens meets <laughs> juggling like i can't even i can't imagine the logistics to pull the whole thing off and yet they did and and we finished most days on time wow what is that day like where you have the explosion behind you and you're diving and running away i mean i have to imagine that's most of a day because of safety and then you're doing a stunt are you padded up did you rehearse it you know, at a different time or, or was it just like, uh, this is what you're doing today. It, it was only part of the day. Um, wow. it's the sort of thing that on a movie that would be the day, the rehearsal mm -hmm. would be a day mm -hmm. in itself. And then the actual stunt would probably be a whole day. Um, and no, this was just a part of it. Like we finished another huge scene, um, Maybe the walking down, there was a long walk down the road talking. I feel like that was before, it was either before or after, but yeah, that stunt was just part of it. And filming the inside of that scene, inside as we climb out, um, yeah, that was, just, that was just a bit of the day. And then they had a second unit there with the exec producer, Chris Grismer, sort of leading that crew um, with stunt guys doing the car chase. So as we're doing that stunt, there is also another stunt unit doing this. And yeah, that was just the, I can't remember the order of things, but I think that was just, you know, that was the before lunch part of the day. <laughs> that's it's that's amazing. It's crazy. Wow. And, and you think about this show that every episode is a, a new set, a new wardrobe, a new, like try and recreate a time period, try and recreate you know, be it a space shuttle, be it a boxing ring. Like it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. There, there is this quality about people that are coming from uh, the other shows in the Garrowverse, like blind spot. And I think uh, most notably besides your role in this episode and Josh's is maybe uh, the first episode of season two, this took too long where I think almost everyone in it was from blind spot. And uh, there's just this like confidence and, um, uh, it's, 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 it's hard to describe, but like a snarky uh, comedy timing, it's just all perfect. And it's that attitude. And I really love that about your character in this episode. And I think uh, my favorite scene in the episode, I've said it a few times now, people will hear it watching this. But uh, uh, when your character is pouring the diamonds out of the teddy bear and lying about it straight to the other people's face, <laughs> it's just hilarious. What what was filming of that scene like? What did was that in the script, the direction, a combination of all of it? Your input, that, like yeah, the, that, that was in the script, and then you know where we only got one take of the exploding car. We were all trying to figure out what's the funniest moment for the diamonds to fall, and 
and so like that's a that's a blast i i there's something almost like theatrical about that of getting to we're doing it live there's another character in this moment and it's the sound of diamonds falling on things and pouring out you know and when's the right time for that character to enter um and it's it's fun to like to have an instinct and then to try something else and go back no no the instinct was right and then camera adjusts a little bit now because of that maybe the turnaround is a little different and it's a real um real real collaborative with everybody um trying to find like the right moment for a joke to land it's a little bit like um like hearing a stand-up talk about preparing an hour of material you know that it takes a year and it takes a hundred shows to try it out and that joke finally worked okay so it's this um that gag with those diamonds falling out there were there were a few good versions you know or a few different funny versions but then there was a moment where we were all like oh no that's it that's it that's where the joke is mm. um and it was a lot of fun uh working with joe and working with alex and working with everybody to like to find exactly those beats and and it's a lot of fun when you sort of you're all right there right at the beginning like we like there were some beats where the comedy was obvious and then we're like let's try another take and then we try something else and we're all like no that's that was not funny let's go back to the let's go back to that thing we did initially that made us laugh um it's a little bit of like it's it's jamming in a, like a really weird jazz band, you know. But like, yeah, yeah. That 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 kind of speaks to a question that I, I was going to ask, and I, I think you pretty much answered it. But the character that you had could be so radically unlikable if it had been delivered in a different way. And you have this this wonderful patter, this wonderful just this 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 way about you with the character. I know it all starts on the page with the script. But then, you know, how much do you bring to that to sort of bring it to life where you thread that needle where this is not just some some jerk that we're forced to endure for an hour, but someone we're laughing with? Uh, because I, I think that was such a strength of the episode was from from right out of the gate. You're hilarious. Mm -hmm. So I. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't mean to gush, but it was just, it was just a lot of fun to watch. So uh, yeah, I, I, I got to think that's as hard to pull off as all of the choreographed movements and, you know, all the set pieces and everything. I, I, almost the opposite was harder. I needed to be, because it, it was, I, I got Midnight Run immediately. I read the first page and was like, oh, Midnight Run. Um, and Charles Grodin is so grumpy. <laughs> Just that whole time and just has this whole like uh, just like distaste for all of it but you still like him the whole time but if that grumpy isn't in there then then you don't get the like him in spite of and so you need the in spite of and i read it and i thought it was so fun uh i had to i had to make sure he wasn't too likable in a way and again the script does it the script does 99 percent of it um if i show up and trust the script it's gonna work um but uh but yeah it was more so that so that ray was kept trying to find the good in this guy which in most episodes is pretty easy it's usually it's usually right there um for him to keep trying to find the good and this guy to continually be like no that's not it keep looking <laughs> <laughs> um i i had to i had to make sure that that was there and that and that he wasn't actually so super likable that you still felt this like oh this guy sucks but i like him you gotta have that this guy sucks first for the other part to work you and josh had great chemistry in in the episode josh dean uh what was it like working together you two I want to, I want to spin off show about our relationship like that. <laughs> that was one that was, that was tough not to just be like improv batting it back and forth all the time. And there would be some moments where it's like, Oh, we're about to roll. Oh, okay. Sorry. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> okay, all right, let's do that. Um, 
we were having a blast. Um, I, I texted him a couple of days ago to like, I said, let's just cut to the chase. Like, how do we become best friends? Like, is it, should we go get a coffee or something? And he hasn't responded. So I think I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to have to, like, is that too forward? Sorry. I'll, let me, let me dial it back. How do we hang out a little bit more? Um, but yeah, it was, we had a blast, a blast. He was awesome. Um, and I had spoken about his character, my character in Blind Spot spoke about his character and kind of talked trash about him. So that was nice um, to have a, a fictitious history of talking trash about somebody before they, um, before you actually meet them. It's just sort of, that's a nice way to break the ice. <laughs> but yeah, he is, he's like a, he is a rare improv comedic beast. I mean, he's just, yeah, he's, he's. He's always ready for the yes and yes and yes and and that that was a, that was a blast. I definitely felt that in the scene where you were like hugging, shaking hands at the end. That was that was really good. Yeah, I I I want to see what the finished version looks like because there were there were a ton of alts of that scene of a few scenes, but like that scene in particular of like what our conversation is i it probably it probably didn't make it or you can tell me but it, the what our conversation is before he comes out of like uh br brick a hashish i think something like that oh okay yeah yeah well so. the, yeah there was there was a lot of good <laughs> stuff i don't know if i don't know if this is going to come through over the camera but he, um, we, we really like, I really like ribbing him about, um, about his outfit. <laughs> um, and so I made, uh, I made this, there's no way this is going to come through. I made this as a fake, uh, album cover. <laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. Can you read it? Yeah. Mr. Belvedere's Mr. Belvedere's lament. Lament. <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment where him sitting in that farmhouse in all of that period clothing was like oh you're mr belvedere i that's it. <laughs> i've been waiting to put yeah that's it uh working with connor uh working with a kid he was great uh kid actors are awesome and i i um my, my daughter asked some sort of circuitous questions the other day about how how is a TV show made? She's watching a show, uh, Ricky, Nikki, Dicky, and Dawn right now. And there's some kids around her age on it. So she was asking, like, how does that get made? And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no. Um, if, if she really expressed an interest, I would, I would help her get into it. But I think being a kid actor is a is a tough gig and and Connor was great. Like he's he's having the best time um and I think that's important like to to be there and be um sort of uh to be mature enough to do it, to do the work, but also be kid enough to eat mostly ice cream at lunch <laughs> is like <laughs> It's it's very important because these kids are are sort of missing a typical childhood, and uh, and so uh, I loved him, and he he's such a he he has such a great child energy, um, and yet you know can get ready when it's time to do the work that uh, that that was really great. Um, I made the mistake of showing him a magic trick, and then he's like, "You teach me everything you know," um, and so that was like. That that took up like a whole day, and I was like, "All right, I need to. I'm just gonna go get some water." He's like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait." But where is the card the whole time? I'm like, "Okay, all right, <laughs> here, you gotta do this." Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed working with him too. That's awesome. That's the perfect age to learn magic. I think ten. Yeah. Oh, totally. That's pretty cool. Totally. <laughs> that, I, it hooked that me at that age. Mm -hmm. Same. Uh, the, 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 we got to talk about the action at, at the end of the episode in the wet basement and the fight scene and the, the BB gun. Talk us through that day of filming. You're standing in water for how long? It's crazy. That, that was a long one. Um, and I, uh, I, I just got my feet wet 
And for the most part, I jump up on the weight bench and I'm watching them. And there's a pass where it's, it's a close up pass for my reactions, but they're still doing the action because one camera's getting them from another angle. Easiest acting ever. Um, and the stunt <laughs> people, some people were phenomenal. The, the uh, primary cast was phenomenal. They're all really going for it. Um, even if you're inside and like it's temperature regulated, it's freezing. Um, and I had, I had these leather loafers that I can't remember the make of them, but they kept the water out for like an hour. And it's definitely not the intention of those loafers. So not only was I not getting wet, my feet weren't even wet for like the first hour of full submersion right up to the edge of this loafer. Um, and so, you know, between takes, they're like giving the like diving coats and people are like shivering and then stealing themselves to like do another take. And I'm just up on the weight bench going like, this is great. <laughs> that was a great punch. That was, oh, man. oh, she kicked him. Oh, um, yeah, that, that was awesome. I, it's, it's great to be in a scene where you can actually just react to what's going on. Cool. It just it, that that was one of the more elaborate things that because it, it goes by so quickly because it's so masterfully edited that um, you don't realize how many moving parts there are. And uh, just the fact that you're able to hit your marks with everything that was going on, the way you came in with that BB gun <laughs> and, uh, you know, like knock the stunt person in the face. How many times did you have to practice that? There's got to be a safety thing going on there. Yeah. And you practice with a rubber gun. A lot of times, mm. but then it's also just movie magic. Like if you looked at that from another angle, it would be mm. like, yeah, <laughs> like you're five feet away yeah, right? for, the, for the listening audience. It's yeah, it, <laughs> it, it is the, there's a full foot and a half, two feet between her face and that gun. Um, mm -hmm. But that's another thing back to your earlier question about being surprised by anything. I think the only thing I was surprised by was that we got to do all the bits. A fight like that would typically be the one thing in an episode. And that was just like one of so many things. Jump off the bus, blow up the car, that big fight sequence. Um, there were so many moments in that episode, um, you know, that there was a, that the stunt people had created the choreography and that we then rehearsed it one day and then we shoot it the next day. And again, that's just part of those days. Um, I, I, was, I was constantly surprised that, that they were packing all of this in there. I think that it's, if anyone hasn't seen it, I think, you're, I think it's, I think you're gonna love it. I don't always watch everything that I'm in, not because I have a philosophical view about it, just, I think, you know, the experience for me is there when I'm doing it. Um, and then uh, if it's something that I really love the experience, I'll want to watch it afterwards. But then also just like kids in life, I'm kind of moving on to whatever the next thing is. Um, this is one because of all of those bits. I, I can't wait to see how it all came out. And then also Quantum Leap, like getting to be a part of the Quantum Leap like extended lore is another one of those. We're just like, I can't believe it. Like uh, pinch me. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. So uh, wh where can we expect to see you next? You got anything on the horizon? It's just, it's family fan. I'll be taking my 15 year old dog out to go to the bathroom around 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> the deepest moment of REM. Um, you know, that I'll be dropping my kids off at their two different schools because we couldn't streamline that. Um, no, I, I, I do. I do. I'm editing a music video right now, and I'm really oh, excited cool. about that. Um, an actor named Ben Barnes, who was, uh, he was like the black hat, one of the black hat uh, characters in season one of Westworld. Uh, I think he's like oh, the yeah. guy right now. Um, he has Westworld. an album coming out, beautiful singer. And so I'm, I'm editing a music video for him and I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, I'm, I've got a writing project that I'm very excited about. So there's some, some other stuff going on like that. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. I, I thought the video was going to be for, uh, the first single from Mr. Belvedere's Lament. 
<laughs> no, but I, I, I do need to include, um, I need to send you that picture. It was, it says 12 songs in the oddity of being a British Manny and four all color knock, knock jokes. <laughs> yeah, that's Mr. Belvedere's lament. Um, and you know, if Josh wanted to make uh, a song, I think that, I think we could do that. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you're you're now uh, your character's Hannah's brother-in-law. So uh, if you got a chance to come back, would you come back to Quantum Leap? I, I was. I, I, another way you could ask that is, how were you pitching your return to Quantum Leap while you were on set? <laughs> um, yeah, I would love to. I I I had so much fun in the blind spot world and playing in Martin's like really smart really action driven world like it's so fun when the two can live together and um and i i think that this is um i think i think uh it's sort of a, a match made in heaven for him to be running this iteration of quantum leap um i would i'd come back in a I'd, i would come back in a heartbeat i was um pitching that Oh, when uh, in season one, when Magic is talking about he felt a knock on his heart, I just thought that was like that was the coolest thing to get into. The, oh, man, it gives me goosebumps thinking about that reveal. Um, what's it like on the other side of someone being leapt into? Like, what is that actually like? Um, and I'd some I'd never thought about that watching the show the first time through. Um, that was such a cool detail. And so my pitch is that uh, Ben needs to jump into Kevin and Kevin keeps saying no. <laughs> <laughs> and so the episode, for whatever reason, you get him there like for a moment. And then it's almost like the scene in Ghost where Whoopi Goldberg is like, get out of me. Um, <laughs> that like you, you get Ben there and Kevin's like, no, no, no. <laughs> so that's that's that was my pitch for somewhere down the road i'm picturing like uh lily tomlin steve martin all of me like redo that with you too totally totally that's <laughs> great and that feels like in the midnight run sort of yeah that's mm -hmm. perfect the the kevin sequel within quantum leap is is lily tomlin yeah that's perfect that's <laughs> <great>. <laughs> I love that. That's great. That'll go in the pitch. I'll send. I'll All right. send some emails around. That's great. You awesome. credit for that. I would. I would totally watch that. You can have that one. Well, and that's. There's also something so fun about a show that that goes back and forth in time. That you know, in in the old days, if your character dies, you can only show up in dreams, or if you have a twin. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, and so those are so played out. But in this one, yeah, like we can. You can, anyone can show back up at any point in time. Um, and so that's where like, I'm, there's definitely no plan to bring me back. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully I was fun enough that they're like, maybe let's, where, mm -hmm. where could we? When they need to leap into Brazil for season three. There you that's go. It. There you go. That's, that's, it. that's, that's, that's it. where Kevin wound up, so. Yep. And to Why see, not? yeah, to see, has he changed? Has he not? Like for right. Kevin to become like a, an ally in this in some way. Love it. Cool. Very cool. Not to gush about the whole thing, but it was just so great. Uh, Caitlin, I didn't mention her. She was great. It was awesome working with her. It's such a, it's such a weird gig that she has. Um, and she handles it so well. Uh, it's, it's, it's so much fun to try and not, look at someone who's speaking and making sense and like affecting the mm. world around you. And, um, and it has to be a weird psychological thing for her to be like, Oh, here's another person who's literally pretending I don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a nightmare of people, you know? Um, and like, that's what actually happens all the time, literally pretending she doesn't exist. So that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, she was great to work with as well. Um, and then Eliza was in the episode too, and she was great. Like it, it was, it, it's just a, it's an awesome, awesome group of people. 
Well, we're so glad that uh, you keep uh, the tradition up of everybody saying what a wonderful set this uh, this new quantum leap is and just the environment. And our, uh, before we go, we don't want to keep you too much longer. You've been so generous with your time. But do you have um, any messages or words for uh, the Leapers listening out there? Uh, I'm, I'm one of you. Um, I think that's that's it. I'm, I'm one of you. I, um, I think about the season finale or series finale of the first run and like it gives me chills just thinking about it um yeah so that's that's it i'm one of you and it would like what a treat to get to go play in this world there's one of my first big gigs was in a western and everyone was like can you believe you're in a western i was like i can't believe i'm getting paid to act on television like (laughs) who cares what it is and so, but afterwards I saw like, oh yeah, the goal for everyone is to do a Western, like it's ultimate dress up. And, uh, and there are a few different people and a few different shows that, that are like a dream to be on and to get to do Quantum Leap, like that's a dream. It's a dream for me. Well, we're happy to be here uh, as your dream has come true, David. Thank you so much for being with us on the Quantum Leap podcast. All right. Great. Thank you guys for having me. I hope everyone enjoyed the episode and um, yeah, stay tuned for uh, Josh Dean's single, Mr. Belladier's Lament. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect.